Today we're going to look at uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 1, and the first uh, few verses, verses 1 to 4. Uh, and there we're going to see the expression in verse 2, thy love is better uh, than wine. And of course we're going to see the mutual affection between the Sol um, Solomon and the Shulamite woman. But let's just pray before we open the scriptures. Father, we thank you for this time together. We can open your word again. We thank you for this uh, book of Song Solomon and the uh, mutual love and affection that there is between Solomon and the Shulamite. I just pray that as we look into these things that you would uh, help and guide our thoughts and help us to um, look to the um, personal aspect of this book and the relationship that we have with you. Father, we thank you that we can have a deep and intimate relationship with you uh, through prayer and through your word and pray that uh, we would go in for this in our Christian life. You would help us to grow in spiritual things uh, and to realize the depth uh, of prayer uh, and the joy of answer prayer and the relationship that we can have with you even as a Christian. So help us, Lord, uh, through your word and through prayer to grow in our relationship with you. So thank you for this time together and just pray and help us. We read the scriptures now in the Savior's name. Amen. Uh, so we're going to read Song of Solomon uh, and chapter 1. Uh, we're going to read verses 1 to 4, just the first four verses of the song itself. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 1, the song of songs, which is Solomon's. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Because of the Saviour of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth, therefore do the virgins love thee. Draw me, we will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. This word is the inner chamber. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine, the upright love thee. And we know that God will bless the reading of his word. Now, of course, Solomon wrote uh, the three books, uh, the three books of poetry, which we have right in the middle of, our, uh, middle of the Bible, and of course, in the middle of the Old Testament. And that is uh, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Uh, and of course, Proverbs um, uh, was written as a father. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8. Uh, we see uh, in the introduction uh, what Solomon says. Proverbs chapter 1, and verse 8. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. And so Proverbs is written uh, as a father to a son. And then Ecclesiastes uh, was written as a preacher. And uh, Song of Solomon, of course, was written as a singer uh, or as a lover. Uh, and of course, these three books uh, have been outlined uh, in this way. Proverbs is a book of learning, uh, instructing our heads. Proverbs chapter one, verse five, a wise man will hear and increase learning. Ecclesiastes is the book of labor. Guide in our hands, what profit hath a man of all his labor? Ecclesiastes 1 verse 3. Uh, but Song of Solomon is the book of love. Uh, Woo in our hearts, thy love is better than wine. And uh, that really uh, sort of outlines the three books uh, the Solomons wrote. Uh, now, in our introduction, we had said that the song, the Song of Solomon, was an historical uh, and a factual uh, relationship that happened between Solomon, one man, and the woman, the Shulamite. And therefore, it has a great deal, really primarily tells us about courtship and marriage. Uh, for example, the king addresses his bride throughout as my love. Uh, in, the, in the song. Uh, and of course, in return, he is called my beloved. And of course, that reminds us of the mutual affection that there should be in marriage. Uh, Ephesians 5, verse 33 says that each one of you uh, love his wife. I'll just quote it. Uh, Ephesians 5, 33, let each one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself and the wife see that she reverence uh, her husband. And that, of course, uh, is definitely the primary application uh, of, or interpretation rather, of the Song of Solomon. Uh, of course, at the same time as this, uh, there can be no doubt that the Song of Solomon also depicts the relationship between uh, the nation of Israel and Jehovah himself. Uh, and then, of course, leaving now the interpretation of the book, 
uh, and turn it into this application where you can enjoy pictures. And of course, it's no more than that. Uh, it's only pictures. Or the relationship between the Lord Jesus and his church. Uh, and of course, illustrations. And of course, again, we emphasize only illustrations of the relationship between the Lord Jesus and each individual uh, believer. With this in mind, the song starts with the mutual love between the Shulamite, uh, who we call the bride, uh, and someone who we'll, call, who we'll call the bridegroom. Well, of course, uh, this verse, Solomon's uh, chapter 1, verse 2, uh, really speaks of the love that there was between uh, these two people. And of course, this sets the theme for the song uh, of songs. Uh, primarily, it's a book about love, a love relationship between a man and a woman, uh, and of course then uh, interpreted and applied uh, both to the nation of Israel and then uh, in picture form to the church and of course by illustration um, to us as believers. The six poems uh, of the book uh, can be divided into two groups of three. The first three uh, deal with love and courtship leading up to marriage, chapter one, but sex me read right up to chapter five, verse one. And then the second three, from chapter 5, verse 2, to the end of the book, deal with the deepening of love uh, in marriage. And of course, this first poem here from chapter 1, it shows the mutual affection between the bride uh, and the bridegroom. <clears throat> and if you want to do a bit more detailed outline, for example, chapter 1, verse 1, the supremacy of love, uh, the song of songs, there's nothing greater and on this song, this song of love. Then verses two to four, the verses that we're reading, we see the joy of love. Uh, Thy love is better than wine, and we can see the gladness and the rejoicing that comes from that. Then verses five and six, the confession of love. Seven and eight, the desire of love. And then verses nine to 17, the communion of love. Uh, and of course, uh, one that is very important when we're looking at the Song of Solomon is to distinguish between um, the speakers uh, in the song. And again, we've emphasized that the king addresses his bride as my love, uh, and the bride, of course, calls him my uh, beloved. So that then brings us to verse one, uh, the supremacy of uh, love. And of course, uh, this song, which is recorded, verse one, the song of song of the Solomons, uh, seems to have exceeded the other songs that Solomon wrote uh, or sung, because we read in First Kings chapter four, uh, verse 32, that Solomon spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs were 1,005. But it's only this song of love that has been preserved uh, in the Bible. Uh, and of course, it is supreme amongst all songs. Of course, it means it's the most excellent of all. Um, for example, in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 2 rather, uh, we have the title, The God of Gods. And then Second Chronicles 2, we have the expression, the heaven of heavens. And that just shows us the supremacy of God, of the heavens. And here we see the supremacy and the excellency of uh, this song. And as we said, primarily it's a song about love. And there can be no greater subject. Uh, even when we come into the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, now abide in faith. Hope and charity or love these three, but the greatest of these uh, is love. First Corinthians 13, verse 13. Uh, and of course, this could be developed then uh, through the song uh, as we look at the love. Then verses two to four, then we see the joy of love. Uh, and it's been pointed out that the identity is not uh, revealed at first, but of course there can be only one person uh, that is in mind in verse two. Uh, it's a bit like Mary's question addressed uh, to the person she's supposed to be the gardener in John chapter 20. Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him. John 20 verse 15. Uh, and then in the circumstances, there was only one person uh, that could be called him. Uh, and of course, at this point, uh, we could think of uh, the different kisses in relation to Christ, the kiss of affection, 1 Samuel chapter 20. Uh, verse 41. Uh, that I think is David and Jonathan uh, in 1 Samuel 20 when uh, Jonathan 
and David had to depart. They kissed one another and wept one another until David exceeded. Uh, then there's a the kiss of allegiance, Psalm 2, kiss the son, kiss of acceptance, uh, the prodigal coming back to the father. Then there's a the kiss of adoration from the woman who was a sinner. Uh, and there's a the kiss of treachery by Judas. And of course, these are all very uh, interesting uh, to look through the scripture. And so really what we see from verse 2, uh, that the bride is speaking here. She is called the Shulamite twice uh, in chapter 6 uh, and verse Psalm, Psalm chapter 6 verse 1 sorry verse 13 return return O Shulamite return return that we may look upon thee what will you see in the Shulamite as it were the company of two armies uh, and so we see uh, the Shulamite is the feminine form of Solomon, uh, indicating that she had already taken his name. Uh, and here we see, as Mark Hugh has a quote, the mutual declarations of love between the couple in this section strongly suggest they are already betrothed. During this period, we may trace the blossoming of their relationship from first love to full flower. Uh, and so what we see is the blooming of this love between Solomon and the Shulamite. Uh, very clearly, attention is fixed on, not on the bride, uh, but on the bridegroom. Of course, this is the case in Psalm 45, uh, when Messiah comes, glory will not be given to Israel, but to our heavenly bridegroom. And of course, then we can link that with Revelation chapter 19, where honor does not uh, go to the church, but to the Lamb, after whom marriage and the marriage supper uh, are named. And of course, we should notice here that the bride refers to thy love in verse 2, uh, and then thy name in verse 3. Thy name is as ointment poured forth. And so, so when we look, first of all, we look at his love. And of course, these verses, verses 2 to 4, think about the joy of love. Verse 4, we will be glad and rejoice uh, in thee. Uh, bearing in mind that the wine, which is mentioned here in verse 2, uh, maketh glad the heart of man, Psalm 104, verse 15. Uh, we therefore read that love is better than wine. Uh, and of course, wine is linked with joy uh, throughout the scripture, particularly Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 24, verse 11. There is a crying uh, for wine in the streets. All joy is darkened. The mirth of the land is gone. And that's Isaiah chapter 24, verse 11. And then again in Jeremiah chapter 48, verse 30, 33, and the joy and gladness is taken from the plentiful field. And from the land of Moab, I have seized the wine to fail from the wine press. Uh, all of this reminds us that as believers, uh, we can say First Peter chapter 1, verse 8, whom having not seen, uh, we love. Uh, and of course, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Uh, and let's remind us that though we haven't physically seen uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, we can still be filled with that joy unspeakable uh, as we think of Christ and the glories of Christ uh, and the love of Christ uh, for us. You remember David said to Jonathan, thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. And how much more the love of the Lord Jesus Christ for each one of us. Every Christ exalting song is exceptional, for no earthly song can match its glorious theme. His love is truly incomparable, uh, not just better than wine, but surpassing all other sources uh, of joy. Uh, and of course, uh, this is really should really thrill uh, the Christian uh, to think. Uh, there is unspeakable joy that we can experience through our, our daily relationship uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Shulamite's desire is nothing less than the constant experience uh, of his love. Uh, of course, verse 2, let him kiss me with the kisses of uh, his mouth. Moreover, since the word love is plural, uh, she refers to many aspects of uh, his love. And of course, uh, that should really cause us to think as Christians, how much do we desire to know more about his love for us? Romans chapter 8, 
verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And of course, this section ends, the great, great verses. Verse 38, I am persuaded neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature to be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, and it doesn't really matter what the experience is. We have never a time when a Christian is out of the scope of God's love. And so we must desire to know more of this love. Second Corinthians chapter 5, Paul said, The love of Christ constraineth us. Because with us, Charles, if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live for themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. And so in Romans chapter 8, uh, we know that the Christian can never be separated from the love of God. In 2 Corinthians 5, we see uh, the love of Christ. Uh, the love that Christ had for Paul was the motivation uh, for him to live his life for Christ. And then, of course, in Ephesians chapter 3 uh, and verse 19, one of those prayers that the apostle had for the Ephesians church, <clears throat> verse 19, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that he might be filled with all the fullness of God. And so there is a sense in which when we grow in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ on a daily basis, uh, we'll actually get a deeper experience of the love of God uh, and his love for us. Uh, in this section in Song of Solomon, I've been pointing out there are different words for describe love. Uh, Thy love is better than wine. That's one Hebrew word. Uh, and then later on in verses 9 and 15, I've compared thee, O oh my love, as a different Hebrew word. That means friend or companion. Uh, and then, of course, therefore do the virgins love thee. Uh, verse 3 and 4, that again is a different expression or a different Hebrew word uh, for love. Uh, and so uh, these three words that are used in Hebrew for love, uh, one means that which wells up and overflows. Uh, that is verse 2, thy love is better than wine. That's this Hebrew word, adod, which means that which wells up and overflows. Then there's reya. Uh, which refers to a bosom or companion. And that's the word that's used in verse 9 uh, and later on in verse 15. And then there's a hair, which means to long for and to go out. Uh, and that is used in verse 3 and verse 4. Therefore do the virgins love thee. Uh, and so we can see that even though uh, there's one word in English, uh, when you actually look at the Hebrew word, there's actually many aspects of love. So then we come in verse 3 to the name. Because the savour of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth, therefore do the virgins love thee. I think it's Mark Q. He said that uh, his incomparable love, which is better than wine, is accompanied by his aromatic name. Uh, which is as ointment poured forth. Uh, and here we see if Solomon, whose flaws are elsewhere recorded, can be ascribed an aromatic name, how much fragrant can the name of the Son of God be? Solomon himself said, Ecclesiastes 7 verse 1, a good name is better than precious ointment. And then he also said in Ecclesiastes 10 verse 1, dead flies cause the ointment of the apocryphy to send forth a stinking savour. So doth a little folly in him that is for reputation, for wisdom and honor. Of course, there is only one wise man in whom folly was impossible. And of course, the ointment of his life was not affected or polluted by death flies. It was always sweet and precious. And of course, Paul puts it like this in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32. Walk in love as Christ also had loved us and had given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savour. Uh, in verse 3, we have a fragrant name. Then in verse 12, we have a fragrant table. And then in chapter 5, verse 1, we have a fragrant garden. I am coming to my garden, my sister, my spouse. I gather my myrrh, my spice, I have to eat my honeycomb with my honey. 
I drunk my wine with my milk, eat all my friends, drink ye, yeah, but drink abundantly, oh, uh, beloved. And so we can look at those three things, uh, fragrant things that I mentioned in the Song of Solomon. And of course, the name uh, is very, very important uh, when we think about uh, the things of God uh, and the things of the Bible. Uh, for example, John chapter 20, uh, John says that he might have life through his name. That's the whole purpose of his book is to uh, give eternal life through the name and the work of Christ. Then in Luke chapter 24, we are to preach the repentance and remissions of sin should be preached in his name, beginning at Jerusalem. Uh, and again, it's, it's in the name and the authority of Christ uh, that these things are done. And then, of course, in prayer, John 14, verse 14, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And so prayer is in the name uh, and on behalf of the person of Christ. And then, of course, Colossians chapter 3, uh, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so uh, the life which we live must be consistent uh, with the person and work of Christ. And then we think of you know, this part of a hymn. Uh, we love thee for the glorious worth which in thyself we see. We love thee for thy cruel cross endured so patiently. And so having now considered his love and his name, we now come to her response uh, and the response of others in verse 4. Uh, and of course here we see that the response is not limited. Um, to the Shulamite, uh, of course, it most probably refers to the daughters of Jerusalem as well. Draw me and we will run after thee. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than Ryan, the upright love thee. Uh, the king drew near, so it drew her and others, so the king drew her and others followed her example, leading to the questions. Uh, or leading us to the questions, does the Lord Jesus draw near to us? And further, uh, does our character uh, mean that others are likely to follow our example and run after him too? Uh, and of course, this uh, passage uh, really will bring a lot of lessons about uh, our daily fellowship uh, with God. First of all, we have the beginning of fellowship, draw me and we will run after thee. The king initiates the relationship and captivated the bride responds uh, with vigor. It is the sight of an uplifted Christ which has brought every redeemed soul into relationship with him. John chapter 12, uh, verse 32. And again, it's the words uh, of the Savior himself. Uh, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. And that is all without distinction. Uh, and of course, to this we may add, draw me, uh, sorry, I drew them with the cords of a man with bands of love, Hosea chapter 11 and verse 4. Uh, and of course, already quoted 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, where Paul said, the love of Christ constraineth us. Uh, and it was an understanding and a deepening, uh, growing understanding of the love of Christ uh, for the Apostle Paul that continued to motivate him to stay in fellowship with Christ uh, and to live for Christ as well. Then we see, if we go back to uh, the verse, the next thing we see is the nearness of fellowship. The king had brought me into his chambers. Uh, not for Solomon's bride, the tentative and trembling approach of Esther. You remember the king Ahasuerus, his court. Uh, she needed the golden scepter to be held out so she got acceptance and come there to the presence of Ahaz and Eris. Uh, when Solomon personally conducts his bride into the innermost apartment, she is fully assured of his love. Likewise, God graciously brings forgiven sinners into full fellowship with the Father and Son at the moment of conversion. You remember 1 John chapter 1, uh, that which we have seen and heard we declare unto you that truly you may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. Even new Christians may approach without fear, uh, for spiritual maturity is not uh, a condition for prayer and fellowship with God. 
uh, we should add that the subject of fellowship uh, or uh, communion is of course contained or continued in chapter 1 verse 12 where the bride is present uh, at the king's table and in chapter 2 verse 4 where she says he brought me into the bank of the house and his banner over me was love uh, and of course the words uh, the king has brought me into his inner chambers that implies nearness uh, and intimacy uh, then in verse 4 we will rejoice uh, in thee Solomon's apartments were sumptuously decorated and lavishly furnished. For example, 1 Kings chapter 7, I read the detail uh, of this. Yet once escorted, the bride is engrossed not in the place, but in the person uh, himself. She rejoices not in his privilege, but in his presence. And similarly, though blessings in Christ rightly thrill the Christian's heart, it is communion, and by that we mean fellowship, uh, with God and with Christ himself that brings fullness of joy. Uh, and again, we've quoted this word, 1 John chapter 1, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write me unto you, that your joy might be full. And so here we see the joy of fellowship. We will rejoice and be glad uh, in thee. Then of course we will come, we come next to the keeping of fellowship. We will remember thy love more than wine. The emphasis here is not on the start of the bride's appreciation uh, of her beloved but its continuation. And that really is uh, one aspect of fellowship intim intimacy that every Christian should uh, really go for. It's maintaining fellowship with God is where we often fail. Uh, we may begin the week in fellowship with God, but by the week's end, we're out of touch with heaven. Uh, and often, even in the day, we start the fellowship with him, but by nightfall, uh, the lines are severed. And so may we take the determination of the bride and our companions to say we will uh, remember, and that is to keep short accounts with God uh, and to keep in fellowship uh, with God. And then, of course, the basis of fellowship is the upright love thee. These words, in, these words introduced a moral basis for fellowship with the king. Solomon began his reign in godliness and righteousness, thus uniting him, him to like-minded subjects. Amos chapter 3, uh, can two walk together except they be agreed? Similarly, as because we walk uh, in the light as he is in the light, uh, that we have the divine privilege of fellowship uh, with Christ. Because uh, when we walk in the light, uh, the, the light, if you like, searches our lives. Uh, we see areas that need cleansing. Uh, but the greatest thing is, it's the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, that cleanses us from all sin. And so we have the uh, value of the blood of Christ uh, to maintain our fellowship uh, with God and that's really the privilege of the Christian is that they can remain in fellowship with God um, throughout the day um, because of the cleansing power of the blood of Christ uh, upon confession of sin and so throughout this uh, verses we see that the king is preeminent uh, we will run after thee verse 4 and then the king is mentioned verse 4 and then we have, we will be glad and rejoice in thee. Uh, we will remember thy love more than one, the upright love thee. Uh, and what we see here is that the bride is completely occupied uh, with uh, the beloved. Uh, and of course, uh, when we continue on in the song, we'll see uh, how that relationship grows. Uh, let's just say as we finish that, then the challenge for us is, is our relationship with the Lord uh, growing each day. You remember Peter ended his letters, Second Peter chapter 3, uh, with these words, and uh, with these we'll close, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 18, but grow, and this word is in the con, uh, present tense, keep growing in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Let's just pray. 
Father, thank you for your word. Do thank you for uh, the bridegroom and thank you that uh, what a picture it is of our relationship with you, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for saving us and for keeping us. And we do thank you that we can abide in your love. And we do pray that you'd help us to uh, remember that we're the branches. Remember the Savior said, I am the vine and ye are the branches. And Father, we pray that we would draw our strength from our relationship with you on our daily basis. Uh, we pray that you'd help us to be keep looking into your word and being diligent to study the word and through prayer as well, uh, that you would help us to experience the joy uh, that the bride experiences Song of Solomon in our daily lives. Father, remember the Savior said, these things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. And we pray that and this would be true uh, of our experience each day, that we would have a deepening sense uh, of joy which comes from fellowship with you. So we give thanks now. Thank you for this time together and uh, for helping them with this message and pray you use this message for your glory uh, in the Savior's name. Amen.